if I go to my regular doctor for standard blood work to check, you know, diabetes or, or you know, blood, yada, yada for um, whatever they check in the basics, will kidney issues show up in that blood work or is there something special uh, that I need to ask for to make sure that as a whole food plant-based eater who only recently went SOS free um, should be, you know, concerned about to check um, annually or, you know, something. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the things you want to have checked are creatinine in the blood work. Creatinine is often checked in a basic metabolic panel, also known as a BM, as in Mike, a P, BMP. Uh, and so you can get your kidney function checked that way. So that will check the kidney function as of, as it relates to the filtration aspect in the blood, but because kidneys also make urine, you also want to take a look at the urine. The, the uh, two things I recommend to have tested in the urine is this, uh, called the UA or urine analysis. And then the last thing is just something to look at whether you're losing uh, too much protein in your urine. And so you want to check the albumin in your urine. It's called a microalbumin test. Um, and that tests those three things, a BMP, a UA, and a microalbumin test uh, usually round out the things that I would do to screen someone for kidney disease, like someone who has risk factors for kidney disease like diabetes or high blood pressure or family history. Um, uh, uh, in other cases, I might get a kidney ultrasound, but I think uh, doing those first three things is reasonable uh, just to, to make sure. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. And uh, up next, we have Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. Hi. Thank you so much for your speech. I have a question about... Um, water. I'm going on a safari for nine days. They have bottled water. I know what happens to bottled water when it's in the sun. Um, I'm happen to be at Whole Foods Market right now. Are there any alternatives that I could bring with me that's not too heavy to substitute the water in the plastic containers? Um. Well, water, well, you want to drink water. Uh, uh, th there isn't really a way to get around drinking water. Um, you, even if you drank tea or soda or juice, a lot of that is mostly uh, uh, composed of water. So you, you definitely need the water. And if you're going in a situation like a safari or someplace where you're going to lose a lot of fluid through sweating and uh, insensible losses from respiration and breathing. You definitely want to replace that with water. Um, I understand your concern about water coming in contact with plastic and the potential for the plastic leaching into the water. You could use reusable containers like a canteen or a bunch of canteens. Uh, you could keep the water outside of the heat or just cover it with a blanket to minimize those things. But I think uh, this is a situation where you may not be able to get around the water. There's no way to uh, minimize water. It's, uh, it's one of those substances that cannot be compressed because of uh, the way it's structured. Thanks very much for that. And uh, David A. is back. Hey, David A. Hi, I had a follow-up question. It concerns um, when you have kidney stones and treating it, um, I heard that an alternative to surgery is sound waves. I was curious to know your thoughts about sound waves, when they're useful, when they're not useful versus surgery and how effective they are. Yeah, so that's a good question. I don't know the nuances of it. Usually at that point, I hand it over to my urology colleagues. There is a way to break down stones through extra corporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which is a long tongue twister of a phrase that basically means that they're using sound waves outside of the body to be transmitted into the body to break down kidney stones that are in the kidney. Um, and that has been used. My understanding is, is that if the stones are too big or too hard, uh, this may not work. So it doesn't always work, um, but it can be an option for some people who those people are are beyond the scope of what I know is I don't routinely do this procedure myself. The urologist would do it. So 
uh, for someone in this situation, seeing the urologist and asking that question is reasonable. There are other ways to break kidney stones, uh, using lasers, uh, surgery, take them out. Uh, sometimes with medication, they can dissolve. I recently had a lady who had some smaller stones and uh, uh, she was able to dissolve it uh, on her own using a combination of medications and changes in her diet. And now she's uh, off those medications of potassium citrate is just doing uh, fruits and vegetables in her diet, minimizing her animal protein. And of course, increasing the water intake and minimizing the salt. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And up next, we have uh, somebody with the initials MB. Welcome. Oh, hang on. Let me unmute you. Sorry about that. Uh, MB, I'm going to unmute you. So I'm not sure if you're pressing your button. Oh, right. okay. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Hi, it's Mary. Um, thank you, doctor. That was really um, wonderful. I'm wondering if you have any advice on maybe some simple poignant thing to say to someone, and I know someone casually who's um, dealing with kidney disease from having a cancer diagnosis, and I guess the treatments there have depleted his kidneys. He's waiting for a transplant. Um, I don't think he's doing too well. And, you know, trying to, I know a few other people too, but trying to open them up to whole food plant-based eating is maybe another solution to help in their health journey. Other, you know, maybe also referring them to someone like you, but, um, you know, what can we say to someone that, because I, I've had people say like, oh, the potassium thing, you know, can't do that, can't do that because of the potassium. Um, but something maybe, you know, poignant and simple to say to people to maybe have them look at this as an option to help them in their health journey. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, there's a lot of considerations, a lot of things to take into account in this situation, the type of chemotherapy that was used, the state of the kidney function before, state of kidney function now, any complications from the kidneys. Do they have high blood pressure, diabetes? All these things play into account and coming into a detailed management plan, um, which uh, could be uh, created by a nephrologist, uh, which is recommended in this situation. But in general, a lot of things that I spoke about on this topic, eating uh, for your health is, uh, pertains to eating for your kidney. The foods that are healthy for your body are also healthy for your kidney. And a lot of those foods are plant foods and you could avoid potential damage by eating a plant-based diet. You prevent, uh, gaining weight. You can prevent developing diabetes, prevent high blood pressure. If you have these conditions, you can certainly mitigate the severity of it or perhaps improve it. And all these things have downstream consequences on the kidney, uh, in a beneficial way. And then also eating a plant-based diet also has the beneficial effect of treating some of the direct uh, aspects of kidney disease and uh, the complications of it. It's by no means a miracle cure, uh, but it's definitely, you know, something uh, uh, to think about. It's like diabetes. You could either eat sugar all day and, you know, inject yourself with insulin or you could cut back on the sugar and eat a whole food plant-based diet and eat and then require a whole lot less insulin, if any insulin, by uh, eating a healthier diet. It's so the same way with kidney disease. You can make something that's bad worse, or you could use diet to your advantage and to protect the kidney and help it last longer, hopefully for uh, the duration of a very long life. Thanks very much, doctor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's bring in Chris now. Hi, Chris. Hey, how are you? Uh, th thank you so much for excellent, excellent presentation. I just wondered if you had any um, um, advice or whatever. I do have hypercalcemia, and uh, I do take in uh, 2.5 and debamide a day to, to kind of keep that under control. Uh, but the I, I, my 24-hour urines that I had showed I've been on a, I've been trying to do a plant base now for like probably the last year that I was pretty high in my oxalates in the urine. So um, I know you, you gave six things. Uh, I was eating spinach, which I now do not eat, but because I realized now that it was bad. But any advice you can give give to me? Um, I haven't had a, a oxalate stone. I did have a calcium stone 20 years ago, but um, I don't, you know, I haven't had any since. But whatever advice you can give somebody with hypercalcerea and uh, high oxalates. Yeah, this is actually really tricky because um, this is like uh, trying to diffuse a time bomb or walk a, a, a tightrope wire uh, because, uh, you know, if I, if I pick the wrong wire, I tell you to do something and I don't have all the information correctly, I may inadvertently tell you something that's adverse to your health. 
this is one of those situations where knowing all the details precisely is very helpful. Uh, from what you've described, it sounds like you have a combination of both having high calcium and oxalate in your urine, and that's the reason why you're on the thiazide diuretics. Uh, so it sounds like, uh, so this is where, where it gets tricky is that if you have a lot of oxalate in your urine, sometimes the treatment for that is calcium uh, to take in more calcium, but that could be a problem if you already have a lot of calcium in your urine, which it sounds like you're, that is your problem. So for me, I would like to know pretty much all the details of what's going on in your diet, what's going on in your blood, what's going on in your urine to see what levers I can modify to help reduce the oxalate and calcium in your urine, ultimately prevent you from having a stone. Where it gets tricky is that most stones are a combination of calcium and oxalate. So to have not a calcium stone, but to have a cal an oxalate stone, it's getting a little confusing. So I can't really say in detail because you're kind of the exception to the rule. Many people just have a calcium oxalate stone and it's usually because they didn't drink water, they ate too much animal protein, they had too much salt, as in my own case 20 years ago. Um, but you are the exception to the rule. You certainly are someone who should see a nephrologist to, to get a very detailed uh, recommendation on what to do. Or you're welcome to see me. Um, I generally, I'm licensed in the state of New York. Um, uh, so that's something you can email me about if you wanted to see me. Thanks very much, doctor. <clears throat> we're, we're out of time, but I have one question left. So I'm going to squeeze in Kathy. If you could do this real quickly, Kathy, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so if you, uh, before you can go to kidney doctor, you have to know that you have a problem with your kidney. What are the top signs that you have a kidney problem? Or is it something that's just, you know, you go to your primary care physician and they do a lab test and they say, oh, you got a kidney problem. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's usually detected by blood work, uh, blood or urine testing, or some people have an abnormality of their kidney detected on ultrasound or a CT scan. So the, the test that you want to do are the ones that I mentioned earlier. You want to get that BMP, a UA, and a microalbumin test. Usually those things, if they, all three of those things come back, normally you probably don't have a kidney problem. Uh, but the way you know about it is by asking your primary care doctor, getting checked. Uh, those are the most common ways. Mm -hmm.